All right. So for those who don't know me, my name's Jim Bell, and we can go on and get started with the second part of today, and I was going to present a young boy that I saw as a consult on the pediatric ophthalmology service. So we'll go on and dive right in. This was an eight-year-old previously healthy boy who came to the primary children's ER with complaints of malaise, fever, sore throat, and a stiff neck. He just wasn't feeling good in general. He had been seen uh, by his pediatrician a few days before. Uh, we don't have too much in the way of records of what happened that day, but he did have a rapid strep test that day and uh, ended up being diagnosed with otitis media with a cephalosporin started. Needless to say, he did end up in the ER, so he didn't feel completely better. He started feeling a lot worse. His main symptom was fatigue, and even when I saw him, which wasn't for a few days, uh, this was still the main thing that he was complaining of. He just kept talking about how tired he was. But he also had uh, vomiting, decreased appetite, uh, decreased fluid intake, and urine output. Uh, he had a mild cough that his parents noted that wasn't really of too much concern to him. And he also had this rash that his parents talked about that a couple days before had started on his torso and spread to his extremities and face within hours, so it moved pretty quickly. It did involve his palms of his hands and soles of his feet, and by the time he was actually admitted, uh, it had mostly resolved. So it, was, it moved quickly and started going away pretty quickly as well. Um, in addition to everything that I just mentioned, his parents said that the first day of his symptoms, the day that he went to his pediatrician, he had some red eyes. The next day, uh, he actually complained of some eye discomfort and some photophobia, although he didn't think at any point that his actual visual acuity had changed. He didn't think that he had any color vision abnormalities. Uh, and he also, he was pretty articulate and pretty pretty forthcoming with his symptoms, and he said that this, this eye pain really was worse on the second day of his illness and had slowly been getting better ever since. So. Uh, other history for him, he had some asthma and really not too much else, never had surgery, no eye problems. Family history didn't reveal any childhood illnesses for anyone else in the family. He lived locally with his family. They have a few pets, including a bird at home. Uh, both of his parents smoke, no known sick contacts. He just started third grade. He'd never traveled outside the country and there were no known tick bites or insect bites or anything of that sort doesn't take any home medications and uh, no known drug allergies. Review of systems brought up a few other things. Uh, I think I mentioned before he had a sore throat and a sore neck at the start of his illness. He also had diarrhea and chest pain and his parents thought he looked jaundiced uh, up until the point of admission. And by the time I saw him, that had also started to resolve, but, but the notes indi indicated that he was in fact jaundiced at the time of his admission. So. Uh, day one, when he came into the ER, his first set of vital signs uh, included a temperature of 37.6. That actually wasn't the best example for me to include. I just went with the first temperature they recorded. But the truth was, most of his temperatures that were recorded the first few days of his admission were over 38. So he, he was uh, running a consistent fever at admission. He also had a heart rate of 109 and a blood pressure of 80 over 43, which for an eight-year-old, those are abnormal. I know that the, the normal range tends to vary for different age groups, but, but those are certainly abnormal and were concerning enough that he was actually sent to the unit. He didn't actually go to the floor. He also was extremely drowsy, but still responsive to questions. He had cracked lips, a strawberry tongue, and then the description of his rash was a generalized erythematous coalescing rash, most prominent on the trunk and inguinal region with involvement of both arms and both legs. And this was the rash that the parents thought was much better than it was a couple of days before he came in. So the differential at this point, when you type in differential diagnosis to Google Images, House MD comes up. So I thought I should include <coughs> him. But, um, the differential at this point uh, includes strep and staphtoxin mediated diseases like uh, scarlet fever and toxic shock syndrome. Uh, Kawasaki disease is on the list. Viral etiologies such as adenovirus and enterovirus and even measles were considered. A drug reaction would fit the description, but he wasn't taking any medicines at home, so it bumped pretty far down the list. Uh, and then a lot of um, autoimmune diseases and, and inflammatory diseases like Reiter's syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, I recently learned that Dr. Reiter, uh, people are sort of looking into his past now. I guess he was potentially involved in some uh, inhumane experimentation in Nazi Germany. So 
there's a movement to take his name away from reactive arthritis. So I threw both names up there just because I don't think the verdict's quite out on that story yet. But a little side note there. So out of these, the most, the highest on the differential for this patient were scarlet fever, toxic shock syndrome, and Kawasaki disease. Like I mentioned, um, drug reaction would have been up there, but he wasn't taking any drugs, so that doesn't really make any sense. But the other two really fit with all of his physical exam findings, and there wasn't a great way to distinguish between them, um, and labs were still trickling back, so they didn't have a, a perfect picture of what was going on yet. Uh, to give you an idea of what he was being treated with, it started with ceftriaxone, clindamycin, and napsilin. This treatment regimen changed throughout the course of his admission, but consistent for most of the admission was that he was on clindamycin with the thought that that would treat any toxins uh, that he might have been exposed to. Uh, and usually there was something that would treat gram positives like staph and strep. He also, uh, with the thought of Kawasaki disease, was put on IVIG and high dose aspirin because people just weren't sure exactly what was causing his problems yet. <coughs> He was sent to the unit and was put on pressors and given fluid boluses because his pressures just kept staying too low for him and he was having evidence of end organ damage. But eventually he did respond to them um, and while he was on this thorough treatment regimen and was sent back to the floor because uh, he was doing a little bit better. Once he was sent to the floor, ophthalmology was consulted because he was a little more with it and communicative, said that he was still having some of this eye pain. Uh, so they wanted our input. They also wanted our input because they thought maybe we could help them making a final di diagnosis and differentiating between these diseases on the differential. So he was a real trooper and actually came to clinic so I could look at him at the slit lamp exam even though he didn't feel good. Um, and I'm, I'm glad he did because I think he got a lot more information uh, from this visit than I would have at the bedside. Visual acuity was excellent in both eyes, about 2015 in both. Color vision was five out of seven in the right, six out of seven in the left. His pressures, extraocular motility, visual fields were all normal. He didn't have an apparent pupillary defect. But then when we took a closer look, he actually had no conjunctival injection. He had uh, a little bit of icterus consistent with a previous jaundice that had been described. <coughs> uh, but he also had two plus cell in his anterior chambers in both eyes. Uh, his cornea showed no subepithelial infiltrates. Iris showed no posterior synechia, and he did not have cataracts, but there was cell in the anterior chamber. He was dilated, and he actually had stage two disc edema in both eyes. Uh, the right eye looked a little more affected than the left, but um, they were both stage two. Macula, vessels, and periphery all looked normal, and he had about half plus cell in the vitreous in both eyes. So before I get down to what this implies for his diagnosis, Labs had been trickling back throughout the course of his admission, so I'm not going to go through each and every single one of these, but the general gist of it is he did have an impressive leukocytosis, um, a number of viral, um, viral cultures and PCRs had come back, including Epstein-Barr virus influenza, lots of them. They were all negative. Uh, his CSF showed an elevated white count, um, but really the other um, parameters in that were normal, so it was sort of a nonspecific inflammatory picture. Blood cultures for bacteria didn't grow anything. Again, a number of more viruses here that all came back negative. He also had an elevated ESR on day one of his admission at 45, which jumped up to 107 by the time he was uh, on the last day of his unit stay. But at that point, he started feeling better, like I mentioned, so they sent him to the floor. Um, so at any rate. With all of that information, uh, we go back to our differential with the top, uh, the top list things on the list in the differential. And out of Kawasaki disease, scarlet fever, and toxic shock syndrome, only Kawasaki disease is known to be associated with the uveitis. So that really helped with the, with the diagnosis, and the primary team kind of honed in on it at that point. So that was kind of neat. As far as what to do with his eyes, uh, we started prednisolone eight times a day in both eyes and he was to follow with Dr. Vitale in a week. Uh, so during this uh, stay, the first couple days, he did have an echocardiogram because, uh, as a lot of you know, um, Kawasaki disease is associated with coronary artery aneurysms, uh, and this didn't show anything, which doesn't rule out Kawasaki disease, but it doesn't help make the diagnosis either. Um, and then, like I said, he was started on IVIG and high-dose aspirin. This was continued after... Um, after I had seen him in the clinic. Uh, 
But eight days after the first one, he did develop uh, coronary artery aneurysms that were seen on a repeat echo. So this happened while he was in the hospital, unfortunately. Um, and the, the entire purpose of giving those drugs is to keep these artery aneurysms from forming. So I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the talk. So he came back to see Dr. Vitali. He'd been taking the prednisolone as requested. Vision was still great. The uh, anterior chamber cell had improved but not completely resolved, and the same was true with the vitreous cell and the disc edema. So he was moving in the right direction but not totally back to normal yet. He said that his eyes felt normal and he was happy with where he was. The plan at that point was to taper the prednisolone and have him come back in a month or two to see how he was doing. So a little bit about Kawasaki disease now. It's a vasculitis mediated by IgA and it affects small and medium-sized vessels by causing fibrinoid necrosis in the vessel walls. So this, doesn't, this isn't limited to just the coronary arteries, but that's where the most common and more, most serious complications of the disease occur, which is why that's what we always think about. But it happens in vessels throughout the entire body. Uh, the coronary, like I said, the coronary arteries are most commonly affected. Uh, it happens most commonly, more commonly in boys than girls, and the more commonly in young kids under five years old, which is partly what the hang-up was with our patient, because eight years old is a little old on the spectrum of people who get this disease, and they just didn't want to miss something like a toxic shock syndrome uh, that could be potentially fatal. So how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, all these children, um, in theory, should have a fever for five days. I think that they sort of trusted that the parents felt that he had a fever for all those days prior to his admission because I, uh, and his fever actually did continue after he was admitted for over five days now that I think about it. You also need peripheral extremity, perineal area changes like uh, swelling, scaling, <coughs> palm or sole erythema. Our patient did have that. He had the rash that reached the palms and soles. He also, the day that I saw him, developed swelling of his hands. Um, and that's another point with this is that not all these findings need to be present on day one. You can develop them as time goes on. So even though they don't quite qualify for Kawasaki disease right away, it should still be in the back of your mind because they might qualify in two or three days. A polymorphous exanthema, which our patient did have. Bilateral conjunctival injection, our patient had that as well. Uh, and then a strawberry tongue. Uh, so our patient had this. And then the fifth one our patient didn't have, actually. He didn't have cervical lymphadenopathy. So, but he did have four out of the five in addition to the fever. So a little bit more about the conjunctival injection. It's extremely common in these patients. Over 90% of the patients do have it, and it is bilateral. So because it's so common, it's not something ophthalmology typically gets consulted for because it's a known, um, it's a known finding in this disease. Uh, but if it is present, and you do see the patient, it should just be the bulbar region. The palpebral conjunctiva should not be involved. And there should, be, there should not be chemosis, papillae, follicles, or discharge. If any of those are present, you should start thinking about other illnesses, such as, for instance, adenoviral conjunctivitis, which with, with which I am very familiar, as some of you know. Um, so that can make people feel awful. Uh, it can give them fevers. It can just make them feel terrible. It can give them a rash. It can give them. Uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, so that can cloud the picture too, um, and that's something that you can be of help to for a primary team. Uh, if the patient has this really nasty discharge from their conjunctivitis, you might want to steer them away from Kawasaki disease. Uh, it often resolves as well within days of IVIG treatment, um, which may be the reason that I didn't see any of this injection the day that I saw the patient, because he'd already been treated for a few days. So what about the anterior uveitis that I saw? There were a few studies uh, that I came across looking at a series of children with Kawasaki disease and the incidence of the uveitis. And one of the studies looked at 41 patients with Kawasaki disease. All of these patients were examined at the slit lamp, which I thought was impressive since we're talking about young children. Uh, and the timing of the exam was measured with respect to the onset of the fever. So the first day of a recorded fever was day one and so on. Uh, exams were positive only if the patient had cell or flare in the anterior chamber. So uh, out of these 41 patients, 27 were found to have anterior uveitis. I thought that number was really high compared to what I anticipated seeing. Uh, out of the 27, 25 had bilateral involvement. 24 of these patients had their first slit lamp exam within one week of the onset of fevers, and 20 out of those 24 had a positive exam for anterior uveitis. 
If you looked at the rest of the patients, there's 17 patients left who weren't examined until after week one. Seven out of those 17 uh, had a positive exam for anterior uveitis. So the p-value for the difference between those two groups was 0.004. That's a huge difference for finding cell in the anterior chamber from week one to week two. Um, so that would potentially imply that a lot of these patients have this reaction that's going right away and then it kind of resolves on its own, especially since most of these patients didn't actually complain of any eye problems. They didn't have eye pain, they didn't have vision changes, they just were examined because it was part of this study. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting. A lot of these patients might actually have these reactions and we just don't know about it. While the timing of the exam did seem to correlate with the rate of a positive exam, uh, gender, age, race, ESR, um, ESR value and aneurysm formation didn't correlate at all with whether or not an exam for anterior uveitis is positive. <coughs> so the only, the only indicator of whether or not you were gonna find this seemed to just be the timing of the exam with respect to the onset of fever. So there was another study uh, that was somewhat similar in setup. It looked at 115 Brazilian patients diagnosed with Kawasaki disease. This study was a little more general. They involved ophthalmologists to look for anterior uveitis, but they were looking at other aspects of the disease as well. All of these patients were treated with IVIG <coughs> right when the diagnosis was made, and all of them received a slit lamp exam and dilated fundus exam. Um, these eye exams were performed in the acute and subacute phases of the disease, and in this study, only 15 out of 115 <coughs> patients actually had ocular manifestations of disease with 13 of those being anterior uveitis. All of these findings resolved within 30 days of the first eye exam. So this is a really different number than that first study, and there were three things that I could come up with that were different between the two. These were the two largest studies I came across regarding uveitis and Kawasaki disease. One was, this study was, was um, primarily Brazilian patients, so there could be a difference in the manifestations of disease depending on the patient's ethnic back background. Another was all of these patients received IVIG treatment, whereas they didn't imply that in the other study. So if not all those kids were getting IVIG treatment, it might have affected uh, whether or not they developed this uveitis. And finally, uh, this study, all of the exams were done in the acute and subacute phases, but they didn't really define what those were. So I don't know how early they were actually having their exams, and if they were all having them week two, week three, then that would imply from the first study's results that these numbers are gonna be a little bit lower. At any rate, I think the take home point from these two studies is that anterior uveitis is associated with Kawasaki disease. And even if you go with this lower number of 13 out of, 100, out of 115 patients, um, it's still a significant number of patients and, and uh, it's still something to consider for these kids. Uh, so I talked a lot about the anterior uveitis, but our patient had discodema, so, so what, what to make of that? Uh, there was a case report that I came across of a six-year-old boy with Kawasaki disease. He was admitted uh, and started on IVIG. Day two of admission, he had eye pain, so we had a, an ophthalmology consultation. And they found, this is actually a picture of his eye. Um, they found punctate epithelial keratopathy, endothelial precipitates, macular edema, perifoveal stellate exudates, horizontal retinal folds along with cotton wool spots. So they found a lot of stuff going on in the back of his eyes. Um, these are his OCTs, which revealed macular edema, subfoveal detachment of the RPE, and exudates in the outer nuclear layer that were consistent with that stellate pattern you saw in the color photograph. Uh, they started him on local and systemic steroids and his vision uh, was excellent uh, along with a normal OCT within two weeks of starting that treatment regimen. So, he, like our patients, seemed to rebound quite well uh, as far as his eyes were concerned once he was on some steroid treatment. They sort of reviewed the literature and I looked at a few of these patient, uh, a few of these papers, and the general gist of posterior involvement in these uh, uveitic processes is that they're not reported often, but it's not entirely clear if they're not reported often because they don't occur often or if they're not reported often just because most kids don't have an exam. Um, if you'll recall, most of these patients from the first studies that were done, really don't have any ocular complaints. And uh, they all have red eyes, but that's a known finding in the disease, so there's no reason to have them on a slit lamp just for that reason. So if this could happen more often than we think, this patient had an exam because he did have eye complaints. Um, 
but, but it, it's really hard to sort of tease out the frequency of these findings in these patients. Um, so posterior segment findings listed in the literature include optic disc edema, vitritis, perivascular sealing, optic disc vessel leakage, arterial or narrowing, stellate maculopathy, and macular edema. So those have all been recorded, but like I said, the, the frequency is pretty much unknown. So I keep talking about these kids who have all these findings that get better and no problems really occur, but that's not always the case. Uh, there was a nine-year-old girl in the literature who was admitted with Kawasaki disease. She was started on IVIG and PO aspirin. Uh, day two of admission, she said that she went blind in her right eye. On exam, she was found to be no light perception in the right eye with normal vision in the left. She had a large APD. Um, they expected conjunctival injection of just a little bit of cell in the anterior chambers. Dilated exam showed a quiet vitreous and a normal left eye dilated exam, but her right retina was white with a pale edematous disc, narrowed arterioles, and no cherry red spot. So with all of that, especially the no cherry red spot, you'd think of an ophthalmic artery occlusion, which was in fact what her final diagnosis was. And in spite of prolonged treatment, she didn't improve at, at all. So I included this story uh, just because I thought it was important to illustrate that if you have one of these kids, it's not necessarily that it's uveitis that's bothering them with their vision. This is at heart a vasculitis that affects the whole body and can certainly affect the eyes through the vasculitic component uh, and can lead to things like emboli and thrombi that would occlude arteries that are essential for the function of the eyes. So keep, keep lots of things in the back of your mind if you're examining a kid with Kawasaki disease who has ocular complaints because it might not be a benign finding like all of these other stories that I'm presenting today. So uh, to sort of close with a final report, uh, there was an 18-year-old woman, and I thought this was interesting. I don't have any statistics on this, but all of these case reports involved children, including the story that I gave, who are older than that normal age range of five years old or younger. So I don't know if that means something or if those are just the kids who cooperated with the slit lamp exam, but the, the children who seem to have vision problems or eye pain all seem to be older than the normal age range for Kawasaki disease. Um, this patient had decreased vision, uh, fever for a week, strawberry tongue, erythematous macules. She qualified for Kawasaki disease, but she also qualified perfectly well for uh, scarlet fever and toxic shock syndrome. So it was really interesting. I included this because this differential was exactly the same one that we had for our patient. The only difference was they threw in a drug reaction because she had been taking medications at home. So I, I don't think that it's an isolated incident that we have this patient at Primary Children's who, who had that very list of diseases on, her differ or on his differential. Um, this patient was given almost the same antibiotics along with IVIG and aspirin, and ophthalmology was consulted to help out with making a diagnosis. So before I go through what they found at the slit lamp, um, why do they care? What, what difference does it make? Uh, well, there, there are serious implications with Kawasaki disease, uh, the most common of which, like I mentioned, was coronary artery changes. They don't have to just be aneurysms. Stenoses can happen as well. Um, 15 to 25 percent, depending on which paper you look at, develop these coronary artery changes. And out of those patients, there's a 2 percent mortality rate. So there's not a huge mortality rate, but it's certainly there. And if you're talking about someone's child, I think that's uh, something to really consider. Uh, it's been found that treating with aspirin and IVIG can help uh, decrease the rate of the formation of these aneurysms and decrease the rate of death if these aneurysms are formed. Um, the rate of uh, coronary artery change decreases by 3 to 8 percent, and out of those patients, mortality decreases to 0.2 percent if you give this treatment. That all sounds great, but if you really look at the numbers, that's not a huge change. You're going from, point, you're going from 2 percent of 20 percent of the patients to 0.2 percent of, say, 15 percent of patients, which isn't, it's a pretty large number needed to treat when you really break it down. Um, but it is a real difference, and if it were my child, I would probably want them to receive this treatment, which is why all these kids get it. Uh, as you recall, our patient had IVIG and aspirin treatment and still developed the coronary artery aneurysms. So it didn't stop him from developing these changes, but um, after a few more kids, he might have actually prevented this from happening. <coughs>
Uh, as I mentioned before, these aneurysms can occur in other systems in the body, including the GI system and the central nervous system. So it's not just the heart that you have to be worried about, but that is the most common location for these changes to occur. So back to this 18-year-old girl, she had uh, numerous findings of uveitis, conjunctival ejection, keratic precipitates, cell, uh, cell in the anterior chamber. Um, she didn't have a visual acuity measured because like our patient, she was extremely tired and uh, it sounds like she couldn't sit up for more than just a slit lamp exam. Uh, Kawasaki disease was the diagnosis. Aspirin and IVIG were given and she responded very well uh, and was discharged and, and did well afterwards. So back to our patient, the final bit of the story. Um, he was started on three days of IV methylprednisolone uh, followed by a steroid taper. Uh, rheumatology was working closely with him and, and felt that since he developed these aneurysms while on IVIG, they wanted to be more aggressive with his treatment. He still had fevers throughout this whole time. I mean, he, he really didn't feel good for a long time while he was in the hospital. So they gave him infliximab, which seemed to uh, have the fevers resolved. So he was discharged and then unfortunately he came back the very next day with a recurrent fever. Uh, so they still hadn't kicked this thing. Uh, he was admitted to rheumatology at that point and he got another round of high dose steroids and he did quite well on those and, and went home afterwards. Um, so if the plan is he's still supposed to follow with Dr. Vitali in the next couple weeks, I think. Dr. Vitali's out of town right now, but um, I'm interested to hear how he's doing when he sees him again. So I think the take home points from this is that uveitis is pretty common for patients with Kawasaki disease uh, and it seems to be fairly self limited. Uh, our patient and a number of the other patients that I talked about did have steroid treatment uh, for the uveitis, but uh, if you think about it, those series of patients, most of those kids would have developed uveitis and never had any treatment because they wouldn't have had an eye exam because they didn't have complaints. And most kids with uveitis don't end up with poor vision down the road. So you, I would think that it doesn't really typically have long-term implications for patients' vision. Um, it's often but not always limited to anterior uveitis. And then serious sequelae of the disease are possible if you remember the nine-year-old girl with the um, ophthalmic artery occlusion. So uh, just because I keep saying the uveitis seems to get better, their eye complaints might not be related to uveitis. This disease can manifest in different ways. So it's, it, they deserve an eye exam, I think, if they're having eye problems. Um, the presence or absence of uveitis can also make help the primary team clinch a diagnosis, which seems to have happened uh, before our case. So that's something also to consider, and it's kind of fun to be a part of that. So um, that was pretty much what I had to talk about. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, I don't think they actually measured that. Did I include? I don't think that they measured it. I don't think they measured it, uh, actually. I could go back and look, but I'm... We interpreted that more as a breakdown of the endothelial barrier uh, as part of the vasculitic process. To that's a good question, um, and maybe we should have considered that more, but yeah, I, I, we interpret it as more of a vascular process than a high intracranial pressure, um, in part just because it had been reported a few times before and it seemed to fit with the rest of the picture. I don't think there is total conclusion on that. If anyone out there disagrees with me, please let me know. But I, I didn't come across any real great evidence of the way that it did work. I think the thought is that it helps with the inflammation, but I don't think people know for sure. They found that it helps. Um, does anyone know more about the mechanism there? 
lost that. I, I, um, I should have looked into that. I. What do you count as the? What do they? What do they count as the age? Mm -hmm. All that stuff for the period. I don't think they're limited as far as what they're allowed to do um, as a child, but but as far as what that means for when they're fifty. So there are thoughts along with uh, Dr. Katz's giant skull arteritis work, there are thoughts that this could be related to an infection, um, but no one has proven that. Uh, they, they don't know what bug would cause it, but they think that these children might be exposed to some sort of a pathogen and have a setup where they are susceptible to an inflammatory change related to that pathogen, but people haven't isolated any specific disease. That's, that's the leading theory out there, um, but, but it hasn't been proven, so. Yes. No, they're not standard of care. Um, so, so they were given for this patient, and, and I didn't come across them making things worse either, so, so I don't know if that's true, but they're definitely not standard of care. Um, the standard is the IV, IG, and aspirin treatment. Our patient got that and continued to get worse, and I think um, rheumatology was kind of reaching for things because it wasn't just that he developed these coronary artery aneurysms, it was also that his ESR continued to be high he continued to have fevers. Um, really, the only thing that had improved was his rash and uh, his blood pressure, which were, blood pressure was obviously something that had to improve. Um, but, but the other indicators that people were going by with him was that he just wasn't getting much better. So I think they were reaching for things and, and giving treatments a little bit outside the box with him, including the infliximab that he eventually got. Uh, but, but no, it's not standard. 